I studied physics and astrophysics at the University of Newcastle on Tyne and the University of Manchester, uh, receiving her PhD in 2005. Her broad research interests uh, include star formation, the uh, lensing of light by gravity, uh, astronomical magnetic fields, masers, and the remains of supernova explosions. She has used telescopes uh, around the world in many continents, uh, including our beloved uh, Parkes Dish. She has been a researcher um, at the uh, Jive Institution in the Netherlands and at the University of Sydney, and since 2009 has been a research astronomer at CSIRO. She is currently the project scientist of the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder. Um, we're thus fortunate to have Dr Harvey Smith uh, here tonight to introduce us to the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder and the even more ambitious Square Kilometre Array itself. Uh, please make Dr Harvey Smith welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much and good evening to everyone. Thank you for coming out in this tempest. It has been uh, an extraordinary evening, so thank you all for coming. Um, now, I'm excited to tell you about the Square Kilometre Array. I guess many of you have heard of the SKA. Can I just see a show of hands? Who, who's heard of the SKA? That's great. Good stuff, because there's been a lot of talk about it in the last few years, a lot of media interest, and um, I've done hundreds of school talks and, and public talks about it. And, you know, it's a really big project that aims to capture the imagination of the world. It genuinely does. Um, the Square Kilometre Array will be the world's biggest radio telescope, and it will help us see the invisible universe. It will help us to discover uh, what the universe used to be, look, uh, used to be like and, and how it's evolved since then uh, to be the amazing place it is today. Um, so we're building the world's largest telescope, and it's an international project. Now, sometimes as an astronomer, I do like telescopes, but, you know, I wish we could do science like a normal scientist would. Normal, say, a physicist, they shine a laser on something and see what bounces off. It's nice to get some hands-on experience. So this is, this is how I secretly wish astronomy was, was done. trust Americans to have fun on the moon, can't you? So, yeah, astronomy is not done in person. It took the astronauts two days to get to the moon and two days to get back. And even at the speed of light, it would take us four years to get to the nearest star, and we can't travel at the speed of light. And at the speed of light, it would take us two million years to get to the nearest galaxy. So astronomers really rely on telescopes. Um, to, to study space. It's done by proxy. So this is the kind of telescope we all know and love, an optical telescope. And this just measures and amplifies light. It just makes you see small things look bigger. And you can see more detail than you could before. It also collects up more light than your eye can see. So opt optical telescopes like these make beautiful pictures. But they don't just make beautiful pictures. They allow us to study in detail the chemistry and the physical conditions, the temperature, and the makeup of things like stars and galaxies and gas in space um, because of the properties of the light that reach us um, and, and, and really allow us to understand what's going on there. And we've, we've built telescopes in space as well. This is the Hubble telescope. You know, this is around 20 years old. It's, it's immense, the, the impact, not just on the public imagination, but on science that this telescope has had. And it's only an eight-meter telescope. It's not actually very big. Um, it's the size of a car. Essentially, it's eight meters long. Um, and it, it's just ridiculous how, how effective a telescope can be like this. But there's actually a lot more going on in the universe than just can be seen by optical telescopes. And I'm a radio astronomer, so I study radio waves emanating from the universe. And um, so this is one of my telescopes. Um, 
This is the kind of telescope I get to play with, and it's the Parkes Radio Telescope in New South Wales. It's very old. It's been operating for more than 50 years. It's 64 meters across, a huge collecting dish, just a big dustbin lid. And radio waves just happen to be emitted by things in space. Not so much stars, because they emit more in the light and the infrared and the uh, ultraviolet uh, wavelength ranges, but cold things in space. And also some very energetic and excited areas of space that emit radio waves. So we're just collecting those radio waves that happen to be reaching us from, from space. And we are amplifying them and making pictures of, of space, just as we do with optical telescopes. So one of the things that you notice about um, the optical, te uh, the radio telescope here at Parks, is it's really big, and a lot of the, the radio telescopes are very, very big, much bigger than, than optical telescopes. So let's have a little think about why that is, why these telescopes differ so much. So in radio astronomy, we, we have big telescopes, and we're making them smarter and smarter, because there's a limit to how big you can make a telescope. So this one here, this is an optical telescope. So the top of a mountain in Grand uh, Canaria, in the Canary Islands, which is a group of islands, um, part of Spain, just off the coast of Africa. It's a nice holiday destination if you happen to be in Europe and you're freezing in, uh, shivering in the north of England and you want a cheap holiday. It's a very nice place to go. It's also got lots of volcanoes and high mountains, so it's an ideal place to put an optical telescope above most of the atmosphere, which distorts the images that you see with the so this telescope has a mirror, and that collects the light, which is then magnified. Um, and the mirror is 10 meters across. And this telescope collects optical light. So optical light has a wavelength of about 600 nanometers. So 600 nanometers, that's about 1 30th of the width of a human hair. So the waves that make up the light are very, very small. And in fact, this, this telescope 10 meters across you can fit 17 million light waves, 17 million wavelengths into this telescope. So the amount of waves you can fit in the telescope mirror or dish tells you the amount of detail you can see, the magnification, essentially the resolution it's called. So the amount of detail of an image you can see of a very distant object relates to the wavelengths cramming into the telescope. 17 million cram into this one. Let's look now at a radio telescope this is the world's biggest radio telescope, and you may have seen it in a James Bond film where he bungee jumps into it or something. Um, and it's called the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico. And it's about 200 meters across. Um, it's absolutely huge. And this is, again, just a big dustbin lid. And radio waves from space bounce in this dish, and they bounce up to the middle. And you can see there's three pylons there. And suspended on a wire from the top of the pylons is this big funny dome like a hat in the middle. And inside that is a system of radio receivers. And they turn the radio waves into electricity and allow us to use computers to make pictures of the radio sky, the invisible sky. In fact, one of the receivers in there was made in Australia. And there's a little stuffed kangaroo holding an Aussie flag sitting up there in Puerto Rico, in the Caribbean. So this is the world's biggest radio telescope. And it's um, 200 meters across, approximately. 300 meters across, sorry. 305, that's it. Yeah, my memory's going, getting old. So this telescope can fit 1,500 wavelengths into it because the wavelengths, we're, the waves we're looking at here, this telescope, are centimeters or even meters long. The radio waves are very big. Whereas the light was 1 30th of a human hair width, and the radio waves are this big or this big that kind of range. So the magnification, the resolution, the, the increase in um, detail you can see in an image with this telescope is only 1,500 light waves, whereas with the other telescope, it was 17 million light waves. So in fact, this telescope is not as good at magnifying things. It's not as good as ma at making a picture, a detailed picture of an object in space. So have to think of something else. How can we make a bigger telescope? This is 300 meters across, thank you. And um, we can't just keep making bigger, bigger holes in the ground. And filling them with concrete and building telescopes that are kilometers and kilometers and kilometers across. In fact, to, to equal the magnification of 
of the optical telescope that I showed you in the Canary Islands, this telescope would have to be about 3,000 kilometers across. So it's not very practical. I don't think anyone would give planning permission for that sort of thing. So instead of building giant radio telescopes, what we do is we build giant arrays of radio telescopes. An array is just a word that means a group or a cluster, something that works together um, as one. So this is a picture of the world with some of the radio telescopes superimposed on it. And this is just one example of a network of radio telescopes that works cooperatively around the world to synthesize a giant telescope essentially the size of the Earth. So I used to work here at what's called JIVE, the Joint Institute for Very Long Baseline Interferometry in Europe. It's a catchy name. And what it is is a big sensor with a supercomputer. And it takes the recordings of all the data from all these telescopes around Europe, and some in China, some in South Africa, and some in Australia, and some in America. And it gets all those signals together and records them. Uh, sorry, it, it combines the signals that have been recorded and makes recordings. So astronomers can make pictures of the radio sky. So it's a fantastic technique, interferometry, making telescopes work together to synthesize one giant telescope. And that is the, the foundation of modern radio astronomy, how we make fantastically big radio telescopes without getting planning permission for something the whole size of Australia. It's just not going to happen. So that's a bit of background on, on radio telescopes. Now I want to see what the, the SKA is aiming to understand about the universe. What science, what don't we know about the universe that we want to know? What are the big gaps in our human knowledge about the universe? So I want to talk about the dark universe. We've already talked about uh, radio waves which are invisible and studying the universe at those wavelengths. Now, scientists have been studying the universe let's say, for tens of thousands of years, because human history goes back a long time, and we found very old ancient relics and stories passed down, for example, through Aboriginal Australian people and uh, people in other countries, in China notably, doing engravings of comets um, many, many hundreds of years ago as well. And there are stories and there's evidence of astronomy and things like Stonehenge going back In the more modern times of the last 400 years or so, we've had telescopes, we've had then recording techniques, uh, charge couple devices like digital cameras for astronomy, we've got spectrographs, we've got all sorts of equipment. And there are hundreds and hundreds of astronomers working around the world to try and understand our universe. And the sum total of all the knowledge ever gathered by all those astronomers um, tells us this, the picture of the universe that I know you all want to see. So this is what our current understanding of the universe is. It's a disappointing picture that we know about 5% of the universe is this stuff we understand. And there's a lot of stuff out there that we can measure through many different techniques that are completely mysterious. So I want to talk about this, this Pac-Man universe model. And you'll see a bit later what I, what I mean by this exactly. But essentially, there's this huge, mysterious body of stuff in the universe and we really can't understand what it is yet. So what is this stuff, and how do we know it's out there? Well, if you look with a radio telescope and you look at galaxies, galaxies are just clusters of hundreds of thousands of millions of stars and a lot of gas as well between the stars. And with a radio telescope, what you see, in fact, at certain wavelengths is just the gas. So these are pictures of galaxies in hydrogen gas. Most of the universe is hydrogen. It's just the simplest molecule, uh, so simplest element, sorry. And this is um, atomic hydrogen. So you can see a galaxy without the stars, just the gas. Looks like a galaxy with the stars. It's kind of a spirally, disky thing. You can see some very spiral structures here and here. Some of them are more edge on, and some of them look face on. But essentially, galaxies look pretty much the same in the gas and in the stars. 
But by measuring specific types of emission, in other words, radio waves from hydrogen, what you can do is you can measure so you know in the laboratory if you get hydrogen and you make it emit something, it will emit at a very specific wavelength. So you can measure that wavelength. Now, through the Doppler effect, you know that the wavelength will be shifted if um, the material is moving away from you or towards you. It's just a physical effect. So similarly, we can measure the hydrogen and the specific wavelength that the hydrogen emits and we can, at each point in the galaxy, and we can measure the rotation profile of the galaxy as it spins on itself. So when you do this, almost every galaxy that you can possibly measure, hundreds and thousands of galaxies, you get something strange. What you expect is that in the middle of the galaxy, the speed of stuff rotating will be fast. And as you go out, of the center of the galaxy towards the edge, the speed at which things are rotating around the galaxy decreases. So that's what you expect from basic high school physics. And what you actually get is this red line. So stuff in the middle of the galaxy, in almost everything we've ever measured, is going at the same speed pretty much as stuff at the edge of the galaxy. So it just doesn't follow the physical laws that we expect if we assume that, there's, um, that what we're seeing is what's really there. This just doesn't make any sense. So kind of one of the explanations could be that there's something we can't see also in the galaxy that's making the material at the edge of the galaxy rotate around more quickly than it would otherwise. Another way in which we've seen glimpses of this Pac-Man universe, this model where there's lots of dark, hidden stuff in the universe, is through gravitational lensing. Now, I illustrate this by a football hitting a net. So if you kick a, a soccer ball against the back of the net, the ball imparts a force. The net bends around the ball, as you see quite often. But the same kind of thing happens with space and time. This is a, a kind of thought experiment by Einstein, which was, in fact, proven um, later on. And, and, and we now know this is a that if there's a mass in space, if there's something like, let's say, a star, say this represents the sun, and the sun has mass. It has mass, which means it exerts a gravitational force on other things with mass. It has a gravitational field. And you can think about gravitational fields like a kind of a, a net like this. They kind of produce a dimple in space and time, things with mass. So you imagine a light ray coming from a distant star in the, in the background, and you see it coming past the sun, it's actually bent. So when there's a solar eclipse and the sun's covered up, people look for, mo for background stars and saw whether they'd displaced from their normal position. And in fact, they found that they did. A better demonstration of this is the many, many examples that we know of gravitational lensing in the universe. This is a real picture from an optical telescope. And if you look at some parts of space, you get this weird effect where a big galaxy cluster, so a big group of galaxies here, has smeared out the light. Because space and time is bending around this huge mass of galaxies, from a background galaxy, the light is all smeared out. And these aren't artifacts. You see this many, many times over. And you can actually produce models or you know, physical mathematical guesses as to how much mass is in this group of galaxies from the amount of light and then from the amount of smearing that's done of this background image. So this is kind of a, an example of a natural lens in space, a gravitational lens of background light being sort of an image being created. Um, this, is kind of, this is called an Einstein ring. It's almost a sort of circular um, image of a galaxy that's behind these clusters of galaxies. So we see this a lot in space. So there's the, the, the strange effect where missing. And this happens with gravitational lenses as well. Remember in the galaxies that were revolving around on their axis, the stuff in the middle was going the same speed as the stuff at the, the edge, and there seemed to be missing mass. But when you do modeling of, of, of this light here, the light tells you how much 
gas and stars total there is, how much stuff is in the galaxies. When you add all that up, there's nowhere near enough to do all this gravitational lensing. So it seems in every system we've, we've studied that there's a lot of missing mass. There's a lot of stuff in the galaxy that interacts gravitationally with light, with other matter. But it, in fact, isn't seen. It's, it's dark. It's invisible. And what people think is happening is that this, this kind of stuff called dark matter, which has a gravitational effect but doesn't interact uh, with light, it doesn't absorb or emit light. And we think that's sitting everywhere in the universe, almost. And it sits mainly around matter, because it interacts with matter. And the idea is that each galaxy has this kind of halo of dark matter around it, invisible stuff that is associated with the galaxy in some way, but is, is much more pervasive. So the upshot of these observations and some others is that most of the universe, the vast majority of the universe, is, is basically ignoring you. It's, it's, it's not, it doesn't interact. And this stuff is called dark matter. There's some other weird stuff going on in the universe, though. It's not just this missing matter. But these three guys won an award recently. You may have seen a lecture by... Brian Schmidt uh, a while back. It was a lecture here, I think, last year about a discovery that he made with his colleagues. And this weird discovery was as follows. So what they did, they looked back. We know the universe is expanding. We can measure it. And they looked back in time and they measured the expansion of the universe in the past by studying supernova explosions. And what they found was really, really surprising. If, if the Big Bang happened when all the stuff in the universe was all together in one place, and then since then, everything's been expanding, getting more distant from each other. And in the past, the expansion seemed to be slower than it is today. The discovery was that the universe's expansion is accelerating. Basically, the universe is on a, a runaway roller coaster, kind of stuck going faster and faster and faster. And the upshot of that is that if we keep going, the universe will just expand forever and get infinitely big and dark and cold, and that's quite sad. So it's a very interesting discovery because what a lot of people believed before this was that all the mass in the universe, of course, has gravitational attraction to all the other mass, and that stuff in the universe would eventually kind of get closer together again because the initial kind of momentum, if you will, of the Big Bang would then be slowed down, the expansion of matter um, away from other matter would be slowed by gravity. But in fact, this discovery seems to say the opposite. So we're still in quite a, qu a quandary here. And uh, surprising um, discovery, uh, you know, with big repercussions, um, won them a Nobel Prize, which is really quite special. So this accelerated expansion of the universe has been given a number of names in the past. It's this, this not exactly the accelerated expansion of the universe in the past, but there was always this idea of something. It was called a vacuum energy by some, quintessence in the past, uh, anti-gravity, doesn't quite describe it. Uh, cosmological constant by Einstein, he described as his greatest mistake. In fact, he then reinstated it later. And now it's described as dark energy. But all those things in, kind of encompass the idea, the concept of an all-pervasive force or energy or some kind of um, essence in the universe, which is now described as dark energy. And this is the accelerated, it manifested as the accelerated expansion of the universe. You know, people are getting on board with this idea. Um, it's a big business. So all this, this dark matter, this stuff that we can't see that's causing lensing, and it's causing galaxies to spin around too fast at the edges, and also the dark energy, the accelerated expansion of the universe, when you expect things to, to gradually get closer together because of gravity. All these things actually add up to a lot. If you add up all the mass and the energy in the universe to make 100% in the pie, 
then this dark matter is thought to be 27% of all this matter and energy added up. So this is the stuff we can't see. This dark energy is thought to be about 68% in terms of the mass and the energy. And what I've called baryonic matter here, which is just stuff, hydrogen, us, cake, chairs, all that stuff, gas, light, you know, everything, normal stuff is about 5%. So, most of the universe is ignoring you. Here's the Pac-Man. Here's his mouth. And there you have it, the universe in a nutshell. So it's a strange old universe, and it's quite embarrassing, really, that we don't know what 95% of the universe is. We've, we've tried very hard, but we're, we're, just, we're just not quite there. So it's very simple. All we have to do to try and find out more about the universe is, is build a time machine, because we know in the past was a big bang. We don't know, but we, we assume from the fact that the universe is expanding today. If you roll that back, you get everything being in the same place, and that's just the Big Bang. We don't know why it happened. We don't know how it happened. And nobody can probably ever know that. But we know that the universe is expanding, and we measure that. So if we can build a cosmic time machine, we can see what the universe used to be like in the past and how it's got to the way it is today. And we can maybe make some inroads in understanding what this dark energy is, whether it's changed with time, the expansion of the universe is genuinely accelerating, or whether that was just um, some kind of artifact of, of the way they measured um, the, the, the expansion of the universe in the past. And you never know in science. Sometimes you can make one mistake and it gets propagated through and through for hundreds of years. So how do we make a time machine? Well, here we go. In the past, information traveled at the speed of horse. So here's our messenger. OK. <laughs> I love that animation. But in science, we know that information can travel at the speed of light. It's the fastest speed that we think exists. And it's really fast. Light would travel around the Earth, around the equator, eight times in a second. It's 300,000 kilometers per second. And light takes eight minutes to travel from the sun, from the surface of the sun, to the Earth. So if you're looking at the sun during an eclipse or something, or through a safe means, um, through a filter, you can sometimes see things like sunspots and solar flares. You're seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago. So if we expand that thought for a second, if a star explodes in a nearby galaxy, let's say the Andromeda galaxy, the light, the messenger, traveling at the speed of light, would take two million years to get to us in our galaxy. So he's telling you the star exploded, but it took two million years to get there, and that's at the speed of light. So if we just expand that thought for a second to a more distant galaxy, if you look to another galaxy, a star explodes there, and the light, the information, travels at the speed of light, and it gets to us, maybe at the same time as light from a nearer galaxy. But the travel time is longer, and therefore you're looking further back in time. So a distant galaxy, you're seeing it as it was many millions and sometimes billions of years ago. For example, with a telescope last year, I made pictures with the, the Australia Telescope in Narrabri, New South Wales. I made pictures of a galaxy that is 10 billion light years away. So the picture is of the galaxy as it was 10 billion years ago. It's pretty amazing. So there's your time machine. Your time machine is your telescope. You don't go there. That would be fun. It'd be like the moon landings, again, traveling through time. But in fact, you know, we can take our imagination, we can take our scientific measurements, more importantly, back in time by using a powerful telescope. So a very powerful space mission, a telescope, recently updated our knowledge 
of the universe as it was just after the Big Bang, less than 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And this is a baby photo of the universe. So it's the first picture we can take of the universe. Pretty weird, isn't it? So what's going on? Well, the Planck satellite took this picture. And what it shows you is temperature fluctuations in the very early universe. There were no stars and galaxies back then. There were no black holes. There were no planets. There were definitely no people. All there was was a kind of soup or a smoothie. So you just had particles flying around all the place. And you got tiny fluctuations in temperature or density to one part in 10,000. So the, the red is slightly hotter. And the, the blue parts are slightly colder. So all the universe looked like was kind of a, a messy pizza base that you'd thrown some sauce onto. OK, so this was before the structures in the universe formed, the stars and galaxies. So this is a real image. This is a real measurement that we've made of the early universe. And we think if you just start with tiny fluctuations from little things, big things grow, as the annoying advert tells us. And if you have a slight hotter part of the universe and a slightly colder part of the universe, a slightly denser part of the universe and a slightly less dense part, but more material here and less material here, then that will condense and that will, that will accelerate and that will, um, through gravity, form massive structures in the later universe. As the universe expands, those will become larger. So if we get our physical brains on for a second and we predict the expansion of the universe from this state where some bits were denser and some bits were less dense, and we switch on gravity as well, we can imagine how the universe will evolve. And we've done that in huge simulations with supercomputers. So this is a simulation not done by me. Um, here's the reference here, Volker Springel. And this is a great simulation of the entire universe. So every dot, we're flying through the universe now, every dot on this um, screen is a galaxy. So you're looking at billions and billions of galaxies in the large scale structure of the universe. And as you can see, it's, like a, a, it's called a cosmic web. It's kind of like a spider's web or a, a straggly filamentary structure. So we think that from small fluctuations in the early universe, big fluctuations have grown. Big filaments and giant clusters of galaxies have grown. So this is a simulation, a, a prediction, if you, if you will, from physics and maths um, using supercomputers of, of what the large scale structure of the universe look like, given the information we have about the early universe. So it's fantastic that we can do this kind of prediction, a fly-through of the huge structures in our universe, of all the giant um, filaments of galaxies. And as you see, there are a big cluster here. And as we zoom out, you start to see big gaps. So there's structures here, and then parts of the universe with not so many galaxies. And these are called voids. So now we can, we can test that prediction by looking across the whole sky at many millions of galaxies with telescopes doing surveys for many, many years. It takes a lot of patience, um, but we can do that. And we have done that. So this is real data now. This is a real piece of scientific measurement from a telescope. Now what it shows you, don't worry about these black bits. that haven't been looked at, it doesn't mean anything. Just, they're just gaps in, in where the, the telescope looked at. So in the middle here is the Earth. And every pixel, every little dot is, um, is galaxies, basically. So we're looking at stars and galaxies here. So Earth's in the middle. And as you go out towards the edge of the circle, you're looking at more distant galaxies. So this is a measurement from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So they did this survey of millions of galaxies, measured their position in the sky, and how far away they are just by using simple methods that we, we've used for a long time. And as you see, as you start to build up millions and millions of galaxies, you actually see structures in the universe, just like those ones predicted. So this isn't just a random arrangement. 
you get these filaments and clusters and giant bridges of galaxies. So the, the, the universe actually is structured how we predicted. So from the early universe, using models with gravity and with dark matter, importantly, um, in those models, we produce the kind of universe that we actually see in measurements. So that's a good thing. We think we're, we're getting towards understanding what's going on. So there's some of the mysteries of the universe. The Pac-Man universe, 5% stuff, 95% mystery. So what, where does the square kilometer array fit in? How will this giant telescope help us to, to understand what's going on in this dark universe? I'll show you a little film now. On a clear night, we can see thousands of stars in the sky, just with the naked eye. Looking through telescopes, astronomers can see millions of stars and galaxies, capturing light that has traveled unimaginable distances to reach us. But beyond the beauty and majesty of these night skies, there are billions of cosmic objects that we can't see because they are too dark, too far away, or simply hidden behind huge clouds of dust or gas. We know that they are there because they fill the universe with different frequencies of radio waves, and we can see these with radio telescopes. Radio astronomy opens up a whole universe of discovery, and scientists are about to make a giant leap forward in radio astronomy capability. For decades, scientists have been developing the technology to build a radio telescope so big and powerful that it will see all the way back to the beginning of the universe. The telescope is known as the Square Kilometre Array, or SKA, and it is a project so ambitious that it will skip a generation of radio telescopes. You're looking at the newly completed 36-dish ASCAP telescope, built in Australia to help develop technology for the SKA. The SKA will be built in both Australia and South Africa, and will be made up of millions of antennas, linked together by fibre optic networks. It will feed unprecedented quantities of data into dedicated supercomputers. Australia's core site at the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory in the Western Australian Outback will host two different antenna types, which will tell us different things about our universe. These two groundbreaking antenna arrays are a survey array and a low-frequency array. In phase one of the SKA, the 36-dish ASCAP telescope will be expanded to create a 96-dish SKA survey telescope. Work will begin on phase one in 2016. Every dish in this array will stand three stories tall and be a highly sensitive precision instrument. Utilizing CSIRO phased array feed receiver technology, these dishes will be able to capture an area of the sky 30 times larger than previous radio receivers. Working together, the 96-dish array will be the fastest survey radio telescope in the world. Also in Australia, a low-frequency array made of waist-high dipole antennas will look to the farthest reaches of the universe to learn about its history. As the universe has expanded, the earliest radio waves from just after the Big Bang have stretched out and shifted from high-frequency to lower-frequency waves. Capturing these waves is the easy part. The heart of the telescope is its complex computer systems and advanced data processing capability which will tell us how the first stars and galaxies formed. Construction of SKA in Phase 2 is due to begin in 2020 with the final design dependent on the performance of Phase 1. The current design proposes expanding Australia's low-frequency array from hundreds of thousands of antennas to a vast network of five million antennas working together across the Australian continent. By building a telescope at such an unprecedented scale, scientists hope that the SKA will make discoveries we've never even dreamt of and change the way we think of the universe. That's quite Australian-centric, but uh, I hope that gives you an overview of the kind of thing we're, we're looking to expect um, with the SKA. So as I say, the SKA is actually a, an international um, project. And all these countries, these 10 countries, are members, financially paid up members of the SKA organization. 
Now, the SKA has been an idea, it's been a concept since 1991. And I can see some people in the room won't have been born then, but um, you guys at the front. <laughs> but it's been, a lot, it's been a long time coming, but just last year, this organization was, was ratified. It's a not-for-profit company based in the UK. And all these, the governments of these countries um, including Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, Germany, Sweden, the ne Netherlands, China, etc., um, are paid up members of this organization. And now the idea is for those countries to get together, bring together their expertise, their scientists, their engineers, their technical minds, their politicians, the, the money brokers, get everyone together to design, fund, and then implement this telescope uh, to make it happen. This is how different the SK will be. This is how big a difference it will make to scientists. This is a real image, a false color image, but a real image nonetheless, of radio waves from a huge active galaxy called Centaurus A. It was taken with these telescopes in Narrabri in New South Wales. So this, this galaxy has a huge black hole at the center of it, probably a, almost a billion solar masses and huge jets of material spewing out close to the speed of light from this black hole. So it's a very interesting galaxy. And this is how big it would look to the naked eye. It's pretty awesome. But anyway, with current telescopes, with this telescope, this image took 400 images stitched together. So you know, like in Photoshop, you can take a mosaic, and then you can stitch pictures, stitch pictures together. That's what had to be done with this image. It took um, 1,200 hours of telescope time to make this picture over a three-year period and 10,000 hours of computer processing time. And you can see the difference with the SKA. It's a very, very sensitive telescope. It will make you know, a paradigm-shifting uh, capability jump for us as scientists. The telescope will be great, but every plus has a minus and the, the challenge here with the SKA is that we pr produce a lot of data. Uh, now, the, the SKA, the square kilometer array, means it will have one million square meters of collecting area, one square kilometer of collecting area, of actual telescope surface. So, one million square meters. The data produced will be 100 terabits per second. That's quite a lot of data. So, all that has to be streamed from the telescopes through fiber optic cables. Um, into a supercomputer. That computer will have to do uh, one million, million, million calculations per second to actually deal with the data and not have a backlog. The amount of data at the end, the scientific actual data that, that um, scientists will use is about five exabytes per day. So it's quite a lot. An interesting fact is the information generated by the SKA, in other words, this kind of, this number here, exceeds the c current global internet traffic. So all the emails, all the videos, all the YouTubes, all the messages, everything that people do on the internet, the whole world, all the IP traffic, um, that amount of traffic will be exceeded by this telescope's data networks. So it's quite interesting. We're, we're creating a monster here. So there's a lot of scope for innovation in, in data transport, in computing, supercomputing, in um, all sorts of electronic um, applications here. And there's great potential for spin-offs as well. I'll be very interested to see what comes out of the kind of work that's being done to try and keep up with this data rate. And we've got a lot of companies, uh, companies like IBM, interested global companies, in helping us to solve these challenges. Another challenge. Um, of the SK is the power, so the physical power required to power the telescopes which move and um, to power the computers. And we're looking at, just for the central area of the SKA, um, the power equivalent of 65,000 homes. Um, I think that's 65 megawatts. I've got a note here, 65 megawatts of power. So that's the requirement for the SKA. For all the remote stations of telescopes, is about 100 homes worth of power. And these have to be located in remote areas. 
So there will be no grid power in these areas, very likely. So we have to think of solutions for large amounts of power in remote areas, which are sustainable over a 50-year lifetime with 24-7 operation. Because radio telescopes don't just work at night, they work in the day as well. So this could you know, potentially be a bit of a monster as well. But the SKA organization has stated that it wishes to uh, invest as much as possible in, in renewable energy sources. And this seems to make sense in countries like South Africa and Australia as well. And we're working in our Pathfinder projects uh, at the moment to look at solutions for um, cooling systems, um, which are geothermal, and um, cooling systems for supercomputers as well, which use water traveling down deep into the earth and back up through the, the hot computing systems to actually deliver that renewable kind of energy challenge. So let's talk about the SKA Pathfinders for a second. Now, globally, lots of countries are involved in building telescopes to develop technologies for the SKA. So we don't know how to do the computing. We don't know how to do the power. We haven't built the receivers. We haven't built the digital systems required. We've never built computers on this scale uh, that deal with scientific, raw scientific data and produce astronomical images either. So all these countries, uh, uh, South Africa and Australia, uh, the Netherlands, Canada, um, this is a Chinese uh, project, and others uh, developing prototype and pathfinder telescopes to try and get some of these problems solved so we can design the SKA in the best way possible. And I'll quickly talk about the Australian SKA pathfinder, which is built by CSIRO in Western Australia at the site of the SKA. This is a real picture of what it's like on the site, and there are 36 of these big dishes. Uh, if you get the scale, um, here's a door. So a person stands this high, and then there's a little staircase here now, and you go through the door into the antenna pedestal where there's lots of electronic equipment in here. So there's 36 of these dishes. They each have a diameter of 12 meters. So it looks something like a, an SKA dish will look. And the challenges we're trying to address with this ASCAP telescope are how to do large surveys, so looking at the whole sky, looking at large quantities of data, working in a radio quiet environment. So this telescope is far away from any towns or cities. It's in the Murchison Shire in Western Australia. Um, we've built remote infrastructure, and we're trying to protect and maintain that radio quiet environment that we have. We're using cutting edge technologies and designing completely new technologies for radio astronomy. We're working on the transport of large amounts of data, and supercomputers, and also working with large international science teams. So that make, means a lot of late night teleconferences, a lot of meetings at very inconvenient times uh, of the day and night. So it's not always an easy challenge to do. And we're looking at some renewable energy options for ASCAP as well, including a 50% solar uh, power station. So the technologies on ASCAP if you remember one thing about ASCAP is that it has these fly's eyes. So a fly has about 100 eyes on its head on each side. And that is why they can see you wherever they are. You try and catch them and they, they always see, see you. So this is the eye of ASCAP. This is the eye of the, the telescope. So the dish just bounces waves off into the middle. That's all it does. It doesn't do anything fancy. It's just a mirror. This is the actual eye. This is the camera that makes the picture in radio waves. So this is called a phased array feed. And it's a type of radio receiver with lots and lots of amplifiers in it. So all the waves coming in at each of these points are measured. And they are amplified. And they're combined in, in certain ways to allow you to see large parts of the sky, just like a fly can see all around it. These radio receivers, which are brand new and designed in Australia, um, are really, really smart and allow the telescope to see not just in front of it, but out to, towards the sides as well. And that means it's better at looking at the whole universe. So when you want to me measure billions of galaxies, their positions, their distances, uh, their, their rotation, things like that, their magnetic fields, you can actually do that without spending hours and hours pointing there, then pointing there, then pointing there, then pointing there. You can do it all at once. So this is a really smart way to do astronomy. The other smart thing about the telescope is its dish. It doesn't just point.
point up and down and across, left and right. Um, it actually rotates on its head as well, it spins on its head. So these, these dishes um, have three axes of movement, and that really helps you um, to make very good pictures called high dynamic range imaging, to make a picture where there is something very faint in the same picture as something very bright. And you know if you point your camera at the sun, it's dazzled and you can't see much. Um, that's the kind of thing we need to do with this telescope. So a very bright object and a very faint object. Um, this helps us to achieve that. Here's the observatory site in Western Australia. As I say, CSIRO has um, developed a new observatory. Um, and the Murchison Shire in which the, the observatory sits has a population density of um, sort of nano people per square meter. Um, it's a very, very uh, sparse population. It's actually bigger than the Netherlands, about one third the size of the Netherlands, uh, 30% bigger than the Netherlands, uh, this shire, and it has no towns. It's called the Shire with no towns. Um, and yeah, there's about 150 people last census, um, as opposed to about 22 million in Holland. So yeah, it's pretty, pretty empty. Um, we, we have uh, negotiated a radio quiet zone, so there are no towns, there are no sort of uh, large population centers, so there are not mobile phone uh, or TV transmitters or those kinds of things, so it's very radio quiet. Our telescopes don't get dazzled by human interference, but we've got a radio quiet zone to try and keep that the case, and it covers a lot of the country, actually. It's very good. Uh, we acknowledge the Wadri Yamaji people as the traditional owners of the, the land on which the observatory is built. And we have indigenous land use agreements with the Wadri people. Um, so there are a number of things that we share, um, cultural um, learnings, and also we have a mentoring scheme at the local school. Um, we have indigenous cadetships, and um, there is very fast internet access to the local community there, so they can access educational and health uh, benefits from that, and, and um, there are also um, opportunities to get contracts on our telescope as well to work to build infrastructure and that kind of thing. So it's a good arrangement, and um, it's nice that that um, the the comment we received that we don't seem to be ruining the land, we seem to be respecting the land because the footprint of a telescope is actually very light. Um, it's not like an open cast or something um, where you're making a big impact. So that's a really good relationship that we have. We've built 36 dishes out there on the site there. There's a bit of a view from, I took this from an airplane. I was getting very plane sick at this point, but um, you can actually fly over. The telescopes, when they weren't operating, you could quite happily fly over and uh, have a look. Uh, we took a TV crew up there, and um, so, so here's an image from that. So what we have is 36 dishes. You can't see them all here, but almost all. We have a lot of access tracks through the bush. Um, there aren't really trees, they're kind of mainly small shrubs like this, and um, uh, you can see a few drainage channels, but it's a very, very dry area. It's not quite desert, but it's arid. It's normally around 40 to 48 degrees uh, centigrade, it's pretty warm, and um, here's the control building where all of our computing equipment and the electronic equipment sits. So hold on a minute, I just said something about not being near technology, because we get radio spillage. Well, in fact, we've created a giant Faraday cage around this building. So it's a massive shielded metal cage. And it has lots of layers and very thick doors um, and airlocks and that kind of thing. So all the electronic equipment is inside here. We've shielded it, it all so the radio waves emitted from things like the computers don't escape and interfere with the telescope. Um, this system here is, um, this is a bed of uh, geothermal cooling for the computing systems inside this building. So I was talking about the computing challenge earlier. Even for ASCAP, not just the SK, just for this Pathfinder project, which is coming online quite soon. We have 36 dishes, so 36 telescopes. Each of these green things, these cameras, has 188 measurements of the radio waves in the focal plane of the telescope. And we measure 16,000 different frequencies. We measure a range of wavelengths, in other words. And we average the signal every five seconds. So all together, all the combination of this data uh, means we require a 100 teraflop supercomputer. 
the data from the telescope, just from the Pathfinder, just from 36 dishes, will fill a DVD in one second. It's, um, this computer to, to generate the data is about equivalent to 10,000 normal home PCs. It's pretty special. So at the moment, we currently have a very small supercomputer. This is a temporary arrangement, and this is the kind of thing it looks like. He looks very pleased with himself, doesn't he? He's got this supercomputer. This is at um, Murdoch University in um, Perth. And we have a huge supercomputing center for the SKA uh, being built right now. The building has finished. It's been handed over. It's being now filled with the, the equipment, supercomputing equipment, and all that equipment will be used for ASCAP and then developed and expanded for the square kilometer array. Just to say, uh, an all-sky image would fill about 400,000 DVDs. And that's just one image, so one snapshot from one field of view. Um, so we're not going to use DVDs, we've decided. <laughs> we'd need quite a big box for those. Here's a little picture of um, the commissioning team. So when you build a telescope, you have to test it. And we're testing all the new technologies right now. There's me looking quite proud of myself there. Um, these are my colleagues uh, at CSIRO. And we're using three of the, the first three antennas that we fitted these cameras on um, to do lots of system tests. So we are uh, commissioning the telescope now um, using a, a three antenna array. And in a couple of months' time, we'll have six antennas with these, these cameras on, and we'll keep doing our testing until we have uh, many more um, dishes filled with antennas and we start doing science. So that's, that's how you build a telescope. So I want to summarize now, really. Um, we built this amazing vision for the SKA. And I'm very glad to say that there are lots of countries where politicians and people with money are on board and lots of taxpayers actually on board with this. And it's really great because you can see from this list the technology developments. It's not just looking at stars. I mean, you're all in this room, so you clearly think astronomy is worth something inherently because it's about human knowledge. It's about expanding the mind. It's about the soul. It's just like art or history or, or music. But you know, if you just get down to the, the financial basics, astronomy actually creates um, jobs and profit as well and technologies which drive the economy. So you've got things, um, new technologies, intellectual property developed by CSIRO through astronomy. Uh, one example is um, the wireless LAN or Wi-Fi patent. Um, a few years back, one of my colleagues, John O'Sullivan at CSIRO, was doing a project on, on black holes. And um, he's an engineer and was an astronomer as well. And um, he developed um, this, this kind of protocol which allowed um, a better transfer of data wirelessly. And it was actually patented. And the application of that, and remember the origin was just looking at black holes, was the 802.11 uh, Wi-Fi um, protocol, which is used in about 2 billion devices around the world now. Um, so you know, a very surprising um, outcome has come from astronomy research, you know, where basic knowledge, no one was trying to invent fast, reliable Wi-Fi that you use every time you sit in a building and, and check your emails, or every time you, you send messages <coughs> through the internet. But you know, we, we like not being connected to, to ethernet cables. You know, but that was enabled, the fast, reliable aspect of that technology was, was enabled by this astronomer engineer at CSIRO, trying to solve a problem about astronomy. So that's just one example of how you know, technology development for astronomy and for other sciences uh, can actually benefit people in very surprising ways, and the spin-offs are huge. So we're looking at improving data transport and storage. And really, SK is one of the primary kind of drivers worldwide for some of these things. It's quite surprising. Um, High-performance computing, this has applications in uh, climate prediction, weather prediction, earthquakes, um, medical research, and lots of other areas. So there's lots of synergies there to share the knowledge. Um, we're looking at long-haul optical fiber links. So 
Uh, it's a driver for the National Broadband Network and um, other networks, um, such as academic research networks, which allow data transport over long distances across Australia, um, and which are available um, not f at commercial rates, but through um, academic rates. So, you know, research institutions get cheaper access to fast internet. Um, There's other things like radio receivers. Of course, we're designing brand new radio receivers. Astronomy as well, for example, in medical imaging. And then other things, this digital system, uh, signal processing. It doesn't sound very sexy, but in fact, everything that you use you know, requires this kind of um, advances technologically. And most importantly, because you are in this room, I know you care about this, we're exploring the unknown. And that becomes just more and more important as you know, the world gets tied to financial goals. And we've got to keep our eyes on this blue sky science research idea. You know, if we don't try things no one's ever done before, we will never discover that one amazing breakthrough that makes a difference in people's lives. So I think, you know, not only in understanding our universe, it's understanding physics, it's understanding the earth, it's understanding ourselves. Um, so I hope you see that the SKA is a project um, that is incredibly exciting and something to look forward to and something to be proud of that Australia is uh, playing a leading role in. So thank you very much for coming, and uh, I'll, I'll answer your questions. Thank you.